speaker today is Dr. Anthony Gregg. Dr. Gregg is Professor in Chief of the Division of Maternal and Fetal Medicine in the Department of Obstetrics and Gynecology at the University of Florida, Florida College of Medicine. Dr. Gregg? Thanks, Dr. Watson. I appreciate the opportunity to speak to the webinar participants on non-invasive prenatal screening, the acronym introduced by the American College of Medical Genetics and Genomics for non-invasive prenatal screening was NIPS. I have no disclosures to make, but do want to provide some objectives for this afternoon's talk. First, I'll provide an overview. Then validation studies will be discussed with reference to non-invasive prenatal screening. I will go over practice guidelines and policy statements introduced over the past one to two years. And then we will discuss applications of non-invasive prenatal screening in the prenatal clinical environment. We will also review some of the important aspects of pre- and post-test counseling related to non-invasive prenatal screening. So let's start with the overview. And I would like to start by introducing everybody to this slide that we're mostly familiar with through our previous education. In particular, uh, pay attention to the sensitivity or detection rate on the bottom left, the specificity, the positive predictive view value on the top right, and the negative predictive value just below that. Sensitivity is a function of true positives and false negatives. In non-invasive prenatal screening, there can be false negatives. We will discuss this. The specificity is a function of true negatives and false positives we will also have the opportunity to discuss false positives. Please recognize that the detection rate and specificity are the two performance metrics of any screening test that are independent of prevalence of a condition within a population being screened. One of the concerns surrounding non-invasive prenatal screening is that there have not been large population data of those that test positive to understand very well what the positive predictive value is. And we will discuss that in a little bit more detail later on. So let's look at how aneuploidy screening has progressed from the 1980s through the current time. You can see these decades on the x-axis. And on the y-axis is age, perhaps the most primitive, if you will, way of providing aneuploidy screening. And then we get into technologies like biochemistry, ultrasound, a combination of ultrasound and biochemistry, and fetal genomics. Age was introduced well before the 1980s and has a detection rate of roughly 30% in establishing a patient's uh, aneuploidy risk assessment. Biochemistry was introduced in the 1980s and started out with a maternal serum alpha fetoprotein. Maternal serum alpha fetoprotein was being used initially as a screening test for open neural tube defects. And it was identified that a low maternal serum alpha fetoprotein rather than a high value was associated with an increased risk for Down syndrome. Biochemistry introduced uh, the concept, the alpha fetoprotein introduced the concept that biochemical methods could be used to further refine a patient's risk of aneuploidy and the triple test came online with a detection rate of 69%. The quadruple test was later introduced as a means of providing something around 80% detection. And serum integrated screening incorporates first trimester analytes with second trimester analytes to give us an 85 to 88% detection rate. 
nuchal translucency was introduced in the late 80s, early 90s, and has a detection rate of 64 to 70 percent. And then ultrasound and biochemistry seems to perform really quite nicely. First trimester screening approaches uh, providing an 82 to 87 percent detection. One of the advantages is, of course, the earlier aneuploidy screening application with first trimester screening compared to the biochemistry methods, which are predominantly uh, the AFP triple screen and quadruple screen offered in the second trimester. And even serum integrated screening relies on first trimester analytes, PAP-A and beta-HCG, either free or total, in combination with second trimester analytes to give this 85 to 88 percent detection. The advantage of serum integrated screening is that persons don't have to be certified in nuchal translucency, this ultrasound assessment technique, to provide still a very high uh, detection rate. The downside, of course, is this 85 to 88 percent detection is achieved after obtaining the second trimester sample, whereas in first trimester screening, we can achieve an 82 to 87 percent detection rate by the end of the first trimester, early part of the second trimester, certainly by 14 weeks gestation. Contingent sequential screening is also an ultrasound biochemical method that gets us close to 88 to 94 percent. And stepwise sequential screening has the opportunity to provide nearly 95 percent detection. The disadvantage of these two is that in these two we're providing a final risk assessment at the end of the second trimester sample uh, where the biochemical methods are integrated uh, to provide a uh, detection rate uh, or a risk assessment um, for a particular patient. Fetal genomics was introduced into the clinical environment after 2010, and non-invasive prenatal screening is where this uh, falls. This falls into the fetal genomic aspect of aneuploidy screening. And of course, we'll go into this in much more detail. But I think the participants can readily glean that this is exactly where we would have liked to have been much earlier. In other words, this is the goal, is having the opportunity to assess fetal genomics non-invasively in an effort to either provide diagnosis or to provide a highly accurate, accurate screening approach. Currently, this technique is a screening approach. So in summary, what you can see from the previous slide is that no screening approach has completely replaced any other screening test. This causes some confusion in the clinical setting because there is a, a panoply of options available to the provider. Screening methods incorporated have consistently improved detection rates, and you saw that as we progressed through the decades on the previous slide. In addition, screening tests are gestational age dependent, and what we'll see with non-invasive prenatal screening is that there is less dependence on gestational age. Now I mentioned that the ultimate goal is to assess the fetal genome. And initially, these non-invasive approaches focused on fetal cells in maternal circulation. The hope was, of course, to provide a non-invasive prenatal diagnosis. I highlight the word diagnosis, distinguishing that from a screening test. The hope was that in identifying fetal cells in maternal circulation, which we had known for over nearly 100 years that these existed uh, by way of trophoblast cells, that the option of assessing the fetal genome 
in hopes of establishing the presence or absence of aneuploidy would be possible. One of the first funded trials by the National Institutes of Health was the acronym NIFTY trial, which assessed various methods across the 1995 to almost 2000 time period. High-risk patients were assessed, and those were defined as patients at least 35 years of age or older at the estimated time of delivery. Those with fetal sonographic abnormalities were also included. Those with a prior history of a fetus with aneuploidy. Those who had an abnormal maternal serum screen for fetal aneuploidy. And those who had a comparable risk, high risk that is, as determined by the study physician. Many different methods were used to assess whether or not fetal cells identified in mater maternal circulation would be appropriate for use. In the NIFTY trial, you can see that the detection rates fall significantly short compared to those biochemical methods and ultrasound methods already in use clinically. Gender detection was only around 40 to 45 percent accurate, and aneuploidy detection was somewhere around 75 percent accurate. And you can see the other screening test performance metrics shown on this slide. So it was pretty clear that at least using the available methods at that time that the NIFTY trial laid the groundwork for an acceptable other approach for identifying aneuploidy and specifically identifying aneuploidy by way of the fetal genome. It had been known now since the mid-90s that there was cell-free fetal DNA in the maternal circulation, and the NIFTY trial data allowed one to focus a little bit more directly uh, on this approach rather than fetal cells in maternal circulation. Now, we can imagine that if DNA is being isolated from maternal circulation, that the patients that have a fetal fraction of DNA, uh, and this was certainly recognized by the mid-1990s, that PCR, polymerase chain reaction techniques, could be used rather easily to identify paternal alleles in the maternal DNA component. And uh, in, this, in this aggregate obtained from the uh, maternal blood sample, and in fact, it was well established that gender could be identified, in particular male gender could be easily established. And for those patients who were RH negative, those that were carrying an RH positive fetus, it would be possible to look for that paternal allele in the maternal circulation. And these were successful approaches where the fetal DNA was interrogated by way of a maternal blood sample in allowing the establishment of gender and uh, fetal RH status. But it would be much more difficult to determine whether or not a fetus was diploid for chromosome 21. And in fact, you can imagine that it might be even harder to identify that fetal fragment that might indicate that there was a triploid fetus for chromosome 21. But through various methods, uh, either using dosage, dosage of the chromosome 21 specific sequences, or an aggregate way of sampling or doing high throughput technology, by way of massively parallel sequencing, it might be possible to look at whether or not there were specific ratios of chromosomes that were in imbalance when compared to a reference chromosome so that identification of a triploid fetus might be made more easily. And another possibility was to take advantage of single nucleotide polymorphisms or SNPs in establishing whether or not there might be a fetus with aneuploidy. Now this would all be very easy if there were some way to rake out the fetal fraction of DNA 
which is reported to be somewhere between 10 and 20 percent of all DNA in the maternal circulation between 10 and 20 weeks gestation. Unfortunately, this is not so readily done, but boy, wouldn't it be easy if we could simply probe, as shown in the yellow dots, the number 21 chromosome, and then, of course, take the chromosome number one fragments and determine their ratios, and this would be a very simple approach. But, of course, we have no ability to completely rake out that cell-free fetal DNA from the maternal circulation. So instead, taking advantage of the opportunity to use other technologies like creating libraries and putting libraries of, of sequenced DNA, massively parallel sequenced DNA on an array, it became possible to identify, again, chromosome-specific sequences or single nucleotide polymorphisms or simply using a dosage-related technique. All of these rely on statistical analysis, and some of the statistical analysis is giving, given proprietary uh, names because of their methods. Uh, you can see that in one um, uh, situation, this is called uh, Forte. Another company uses the word PS. But the idea is that there is significant statistical analysis that's required to determine what is really happening on these arrays or um, uh, on these specific platforms that are commercially uh, different from one another. So let's look at some of the validation studies that were used to validate non-invasive prenatal screening technologies. On the far left of the slide, I have listed the four companies that currently provide non-invasive prenatal screening in a clinical setting. And the next slide indicates the approximate size of the trials uh, that were used to validate uh, these specific technologies. The populations are important to note uh, in the next column over because high-risk populations are largely what was utilized. High risk was defined very similar in nearly every trial according to the way uh, high-risk populations were gathered in the NIFTY trial. Failure rates, in other words, did the technology fail to provide a result? The detection rate or sensitivity is shown in the next slide over. Importantly, uh, one can see that these detection rates approach 100%. Specificity, positive predictive value, false positive rates, negative predictive value, and false negative rates are also shown on this slide. You'll note first that high-risk populations were used and failure rates in these validation studies ranged from zero to as high as 13 percent. We'll discuss a little bit in a little uh, later what causes these failure rates, but predominantly the factor that's important is the percent of cell-free fetal DNA in the maternal circulation. Gestational age is a factor in this, in this aspect, and it is a factor that determines that cell-free fetal DNA fraction. It turns out that the cell-free fetal DNA fraction is gestational age dependent. But once reaching a critical gestational age, there is a cell-free fetal DNA fraction that remains adequate throughout the rest of the pregnancy. That critical or lower limit cell, uh, gestational age seems to be at nine weeks or 10 weeks gestation. You'll notice the detection rates and positive predictive values reported in high risk populations are very high. And again, we'll speak to the fact that low risk or average risk patients 
have not been studied in a validation trial. And this leads some to ask the question whether the positive predictive values will remain as high when we get to a low risk or average risk population. So in summary, four companies are currently processing clinical samples in the United States for aneuploidy risk assessment. Validation trials focused on high risk patient groups. And I should point out that in the previous slide, I showed validation data for trisomy 21. It turns out that other common aneuploidies are also detected through the same platform and the same sample presented to the laboratory. There is a small sacrifice of detection rate and positive predictive value and other test performance metrics, but not in a significant uh, way. And we should point out that the detection and test performance for these other aneuploidies are at least as good and really better than any of the other uh, options available to patients today. But detection rates and specificity exceed those reported for any other aneuploidy screening test. I mentioned that the positive predictive value may be sacrificed when studies from average or low risk patients are reported. Let's look now at the practice guidelines and policy statements put forth by a number of professional organizations. Once again, if we look across a, just a timeline, we see 2011, 2012, and 2013. The International Society for Prenatal Diagnosis has put out practice guidelines that at least mentioned non-invasive prenatal screening as early as 2011, but focus more specifically on its introduction into clinical practice beginning in 2012, and then a more recent practice guideline in 2013. The National Society of Genetics Counselors weighs in in two, late 2012, and early 2013 with some minor revisions of its November 2012 statement. The American College of Obstetricians and Gynecologists weighed in with a committee opinion in 2012, December, and the American College of Medical Genetics and Genomics weighed in with a policy statement in May of 2013. What is important to recognize is that the American College of Obstetricians and Gynecologists, the International Society of Prenatal Diagnosis, and the National Society of Genetics Counselors propose that the use of non-invasive prenatal screening should be a targeted utilization, such that high-risk patient groups should be those that have this screening modality offered to them. You'll notice when looking at this slide that the targeted population mirrors that identified or used in the NIFTY trial. That is, patients over age 35 at the time of delivery, those with ultrasound findings indicating an increased risk of aneuploidy, and this is uh, broadly defined, perhaps soft markers. One would ask, where do birth defects fit? Should those with birth defects undergo non-invasive prenatal screening, or should those patients be offered only invasive testing? The history of a prior pregnancy with a trisomy is on this list. Those that have abnormal screening tests and those with a parental balanced Robertsonian translocation involving chromosomes 13 or 21 uh, might also uh, be uh, on this list. So I think this is important because previously many in this group were offered invasive testing as the next step rather than another screening test. Now the American College of Medical Genetics and Genomics simply introduced the concept that non-invasive prenatal screening approaches 
where appropriate screening modalities to offer in, in, as part of the armamentarium available in any clinical environment. Why the distinction? It gets back to this. I, I showed this earlier in the webinar that the positive predictive value is importantly influenced by prevalence. In specific, you can see that prevalence is directly related to the number of true positives on a screening panel. The higher the prevalence of a specific condition, such as those populations studied in the NIFTY trial and those recommended for screening by the professional organizations, those patient populations are going to have a higher true positive rate, thus the positive predictive value is going to be quite high, and you saw that in the validation studies. Well, what about the false positives? Often, uh, this term is ignored when thinking about positive predictive value. In other words, many believe the false positive rate will remain static and independent of whether or not a, a screening test is applied to a low prevalence or high prevalence uh, uh, patient population. Well, one question to ask is, is this, is this term fixed or increased, and is this only an assumption, and can this assumption uh, hold true for non-invasive prenatal screening? When we look at non-invasive prenatal screening, we got to consider what causes false positives. Well, we know of at least three mechanisms for false positives when using this technology. We know that this technology is not specific for identifying fetal DNA from the fetal corpus. In fact, the placenta, considered a fetal organ, also and in, in, in predominance is the, is the source of the fetal DNA in the maternal circulation. So in cases where there is placental mosaicism, we can potentially have a false positive test result. So placental mosaicism for trisomy 21 might cause an abnormal or false positive result. In addition, when there are twins and one twin has vanished so that twins were not recognized early in pregnancy, this can be a source of false positive test results. We do know that in twins and higher order pregnancies, non-invasive prenatal screening is generally not recommended as the screening modality for use. DNA from other sources, for example tumors, can also be found in the maternal circulation. So there are many reports where mothers had a pregnancy that known or unknown was complicated by a cancer, uh, was a source of, of cell-free fetal DNA or cell-free DNA that was not fetal, but there was an overrepresentation of this DNA that was other than the maternal genomic DNA. And we know that in many cancers, there can't be aneuploidies present. Those aneuploidies might be picked up on a non-invasive prenatal screening panel. So can maternal age affect any of these causes of false positive? You'll remember that maternal age was one of those for which targeted screening is the preferred choice. Well, it turns out that mat maternal age might affect placental mosaicism. We know that twinning can occur more often in persons of advanced maternal age due to irregularities of the ovulatory process. And it would be conceivable to accept the fact that cancers might be overrepresented in those women of advanced maternal age rather than those that are younger. Do patients with a prior trisomy impact any of these? or those with abnormal screening or ultrasound finding, could those patients in these high-risk groups also cause the false positive rate uh, to increase? I think there are still several unknowns as relates to this, but hopefully over time we'll be able to identify whether these are in fact true.
So we're left with the idea that the false positive um, rate might be increased in those high-risk patient groups for which targeted use of non-invasive prenatal screening techniques is recommended. But I leave this as an open question. And could the positive predictive value then not be so readily uh, influenced in low-risk populations because if the false positive rate is also decreasing with the true positive rate, there will be less sacrifice of the positive predictive value. And we might find that low-risk patients are also a patient group that is appropriate to screen uh, using non-invasive prenatal screening techniques. But once again, there are at least two trials uh, ongoing or for which we're waiting for data on to address how positive predictive value and what magnitude positive predictive value is going to change when surveying low or average risk patient groups. Recognizing that these trials were ongoing, the American College of Medical Genetics and Genomics stayed silent with respect to defining a targeted group that was appropriate for non-invasive prenatal screening. So let's look at how non-invasive prenatal screening might be applied in a clinical setting. And I show you on this slide in a diagrammatic way some of the pros and cons of the modalities currently in use. In number A or letter A on the top portion of this diagram, we can see that analytes, first trimester analytes, PAP-A and beta-HCG, and nuchal translucency combine to give us a first trimester risk assessment that risk assessment is generally available by 14 weeks gestation. And in those patients that use first trimester screening, a maternal serum alpha fetoprotein test is also recommended in an effort to provide a risk of open neural tube defect. So this modality incorporates the ultrasound and biochemistry very early in pregnancy, along with a later need for a blood draw to assess open neural tube risk. In B, the quad screen, and keep in mind that many patients do not present early enough for this ultrasound biochemical testing uh, to be applied, so the quad screen remains uh, an appropriate screening test for those patients. And the maternal serum alpha fetoprotein is incorporated, of course, in the quad screen blood draw so that a single blood test provides risk for aneuploidy and provides risk for open neural tube defect. I removed from this A and B paradigm the stepwise sequential uh, test the contingent sequential, and the serum integrated. Although I recognize that many clinics will use these approaches, these approaches are, for some clinics, cumbersome because they require multiple interactions with the patient and multiple blood draws through the prenatal screening uh, clinic in an effort to provide appropriate risk assessment. Now, how would non-invasive prenatal screening be, be used, and what are some of its advantages? I think you can see that non-invasive prenatal screening can be provided as early as nine weeks in the case of uh, one of the companies that offers this testing, but certainly by 10 weeks for all of the other companies. And there is no gap, as is seen with some of the others, at which you can offer non-invasive prenatal screening. The non-invasive prenatal screening can be applied then across pregnancy, but in the screening environment, there would be the opportunity to obtain this all the way out to, to 20 weeks and still provide a risk assessment by 22 weeks gestation. <clears throat> 
there is a strong recommendation by all of the professional organizations that ultrasound not be eliminated, although it's not being used specifically in this case for aneuploidy screening. It does provide many other benefits, such as an early screen for birth defects, identifying twins at an early gestational age, and it has the opportunity um, to uh, adjust gestational age uh, as needed. But there are many um, uh, benefits of an early ultrasound uh, in pregnancy, and all professional organizations recommend that this continue. Of course, non-invasive prenatal screening does not screen for open neural tube defects, so a maternal serum alpha fetoprotein uh, is recommended. There is recent discussion about the need for adding a maternal serum alpha fetoprotein to any of these paradigms in an effort to screen for open neural tube defects. And one reason for this new discussion is whether or not the ultrasound technology has advanced in such a way that this screening approach uh, can be eliminated. But uh, again, this, this um, is still being used, I think, in most places uh, throughout the country. The um, important thing to recognize is that these screening modalities or these screening applications have a lower detection rate and for many, a higher false positive rate, 3 to 5 percent, compared to what we think will be the false positive rate of non-invasive prenatal screening. And we've already seen from earlier slides that the detection rate is much higher. What are some future applications of non-invasive prenatal screening? There have already been reports that microdeletions and microduplications might be identified routinely by a single sample of blood from mother and then recognizing that fetal DNA circulates within. Could we effectively apply a microdeletion, microduplication approach, uh, an array approach, if you will, an array CGH to the DNA uh, in that maternal circulation? We can probably guess that since we can already establish fetal gender and fetal RH status, we might target specific genes using cell-free fetal DNA as the template. We might also provide whole genome sequencing of the fetus someday uh, if the te technological advances continue on pace as they have over the past decade. While we now have access to the fetal genome, and we do believe that these opportunities uh, will present themselves and might even become uh, routine uh, in the future. Now, what about specific counseling uh, concerns? Well, what are the limitations of non-invasive prenatal screening? One, we have to remind ourselves in the pretest counseling environment that non-invasive prenatal screening is just that. It's a screening test, despite the fact that we're interrogating the fetal genome. We know that there are false positives, and therefore uh, it is important anytime there's a false positive to be sure, anytime there's a positive test result, to be sure to rule out false positives by offering invasive uh, diagnostic testing. One important aspect for patients and providers to remember is that non-invasive prenatal screening detects less than 50% of genomic imbalances that could be serious. The focus is only on common aneuploidies at this time. That includes trisomy 13, trisomy 18, and common sex chromosome aneuploidies. It does not detect single gene abnormalities yet. It is, uh, and we know that uninformative results can occur. For example, a patient who has a blood draw at seven or eight weeks is not likely to have enough cell-free fetal DNA fraction to provide an informative result. We also know that for 
larger patients, those that are morbidly obese, that providing a sample at 9, 10 weeks gestation, they might also have a lower cell-free fetal DNA fraction. I mentioned earlier that non-invasive prenatal screening does not address risk for neural tube defects or for other complications that are seen in pregnancy, such as an increased risk for one of the adverse pregnancy outcomes, uh, pre hypertensive conditions, stillbirth, growth restriction, and placental abruption, which are sometimes there is some risk uh, that is um, uh, used clinically to predict that risk of, of any of those adverse pregnancy outcomes uh, when the alpha fetal protein test is high. It's not a substitute for ultrasound, as I mentioned, and it is limited to singleton pregnancies. Well, let's eliminate for a second the concept that all screening tests are not diagnostic by definition. Any of the screening tests already in use today are not detecting all of the other possible genomic imbalances. For example, these also focus primarily on common aneuploidies. And these tests, likewise, do not detect single gene abnormalities. They're not also a substitute for ultrasound. So we see when we add all these up, while the list looks like a long laundry list for which non-invasive prenatal screening would not be appropriate, we must recognize that this, many of these are true of other screening tests in vogue today for fetal aneuploidy. So there is a adjusted limitations list, if you will. One is that uninformative results occur. It does not address neural tube defects. This is true, for example, of first trimester screening as well. It's limited to singletons. Some of the screening options available are also limited to singletons. And some of those other screening modalities might also have limited utility in forecasting late pre uh, pregnancy outcome complications. But again, that pretest counseling list is not as long as uh, it initially seems uh, to be with regards to limitations. In the pretest counseling environment, there are some benefits uh, that patients should be made aware of. First, that the performance appears better than any other screening test to date, at least based on what we know from validation studies. And in particular, if these can be applied to low or average risk patient populations, we might see this uh, used uh, more readily if the performance test metrics uh, remain robust. The risk assessment is less dependent on gestational age. We don't have that gap between 14 and and 15 or 16 weeks gestation uh, that we saw on one of those earlier uh, slides. So even if the gestational age is adjusted early in pregnancy, uh, that sample drawn as early as 9 to 10 weeks would still be appropriate for providing a, a risk assessment. In the post-test counseling environment, we do recommend always after a positive uh, result that we recognize that false positives do occur and that there's an important um, uh, aspect that we offer an invasive test uh, every time there's a positive test result returned after non-invasive prenatal screening. This is no different, by the way, than any of the screening modalities currently in use today. Patients after serum screening first trimester screening or any of the other approaches, uh, if they fall in a high-risk group after screening, they are offered an invasive uh, diagnostic test. Postnatal confirmation should be done when patients decline invasive testing. If a negative test results, particularly in high-risk groups, one should be aware, again, of false negatives, and we should be sure to make sure that those patients that were in high-risk groups were indeed offered an invasive test. When results are positive, we should provide balanced, up-to-date information about, the, about Down syndrome or other aneuploidies that might have returned positive after non-invasive prenatal screening. So in summary, non-invasive prenatal screening 
um, is, has the best aneuploidy screening test metrics when compared to all others. We can consider, though, non-invasive prenatal aneuploidy screening detection as version 2.0. That is, that as we employ other means of interrogating the fetal genome, we are going to find uh, other uses for cell-free fetal DNA. If positive predictive value does not yield much ground in low or average risk patient populations, it could replace many of the current aneuploidy screening options and eliminate patient and provider confusion. You saw that we, do, we have not replaced any of the screening approaches today, and there is a lot of confusion uh, from the provider side related to which screening test is most appropriate in which patient population. I list here many of the references used for this talk. I'll be quiet as I page through these uh, for a moment. I want to thank those webinar participants for uh, listening today, and um, I hope that uh, you learned something. Thank you. All right. Thank you, Dr. Gregg. Uh, this is a really interesting topic because it's really in its early days of transition of new technology into increasing levels of resolution that are going to be applied in some of these areas of, of genetic and genomic screening. Uh, so we appreciate your, your presentation and want to thank you.